through the centuries, to leave Earth was an impossible fantasy. Then two rival scientists became locked in a race to realize that dream. Their struggle would make history. Fire! At the end of World War II, Russia and America raced to capture the secrets of Germany's rocket technology. Who's the brains behind all this? Werner von Braun was a rocket genius years ahead of his time. When he surrendered to the Americans, he brought with him his dreams for space. We had other rockets at the theoretical stage. In time, other rockets will leave Earth orbit altogether and explore other planets. But von Braun's vision had come at a price. Were you ever a member of the National Socialist Party? Yes, I was. And the SS? Yes, I held the rank of major. Slave labor was used to construct von Braun's rockets. You were aware of the existence of the V2 mass production plant? You saw the conditions. Don't you imagine someone else would have done the work if I had refused? Unknown to von Braun, the Soviets had a space visionary of their own. Your confession. Sergei Koryalov was sentenced to 10 years in the Gulag for crimes he did not commit. Once released, he became the chief designer of Russia's rocket program and was so successful that his very existence was hidden from the West. In the interests of state security, no one must know your identity. It must be as if you don't exist. After the Second World War, an iron curtain fell across the ruins of Europe, separating the communist East from the capitalist West. Two superpowers, America and the Soviet Union, became locked in a new arms race. The Cold War began as each side feared a preemptive nuclear strike by the other. In 1952, the Americans tested the most powerful weapon the world had ever seen, the hydrogen bomb. The year is now 1953. On the 12th of August, the Soviets also explode an H-bomb. The race is on for nuclear supremacy. Congratulations, comrades. Good job, well done. May all such future devices explode as successfully. He's here, the person. The H-bomb test leads to a momentous meeting for Sergei Koryalov, the Soviet's chief rocket designer. Good morning, Comrade Marshal. What an unexpected surprise. Please. Koryalov's military paymasters set him the challenge of a lifetime. Five tons. You're proposing a five-ton warhead. That's what our physicists are telling us that the next generation of hydrogen bomb will win. The Defense Ministry has looked into aircraft as a delivery system. But we've concluded that aircraft are too slow and too easily targeted. What we need is a rocket that can deliver it over a distance of 8,000 kilometers, capable of reaching America. And in this way, safeguard ourselves against our enemies. With respect, the Ministry does understand that there is nothing currently under development that has anything like that capability. Obviously. So the question is a simple one. Can it be done? Of course, Conrad. Koryalov hopes that by meeting the military's need, 
he will be able to fulfill his long-held ambition to journey into space. The first step will be to launch a satellite to orbit the Earth. Then manned spaceflight will follow. But on the other side of the world, in America, Koryolov knows he has a rival. What he doesn't know is that his rival faces a crisis. Restricted by the US Army to develop only small, short-range rockets, Werner von Braun's ambitions are crushed. Victory is stable, gyros functioning normally. Von Braun has brought his team from Germany, hoping to pursue a space program. Bridge is clear. Good. We have hours of data collection ahead of us. Let's uh, have a short break. Besides, I have some news to pass on to you. But their employers, the US Army, have sidelined him. Are they serious? We're simply not a priority at the moment. They want the funds elsewhere. Nonetheless, I remain convinced. They will see sense eventually. We'll get our shot. They're cutting back our funds even for military missions. Very Jews world. To carry such a weight, such a distance, we need to get radical. Well, I'm all in favor of that, but you'll never get one engine to carry a five-ton warhead. But what if we use several engines, firing together to share the load? But there's no telling on the impact of one engine on another. It's never been tried. Well, that's a challenge for you, Bounty. What I propose is four clusters of main engines strapped to the main body of the rocket. Once they've accelerated the rocket to sufficient speed, the clusters drop away, shedding the dead weight, allowing the central core to continue at a faster velocity. Look, I need your help with these engines. All right, it is ambitious, but if we combine our forces, we just might make history. It's a huge gamble. But if they succeed, they will have the means to get to space. The engines will be my department, and mine alone. All right, I'll do it. Koryolov's new rocket, designated the R-7, would be so huge, even its launch site has to be designed from scratch at a remote site 1,400 miles from Moscow. Well, it's certainly bleak. Have you get used to it, Vasily. This is going to be home. Marshal Mitrofan Nadelin supervises the project, reporting directly to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. 36 hours by train and dead truck. This rocket better be everything you promised, Sergei Pavlovich. The R-7 is a bold design, but the defense of the motherland deserves nothing less. I have a proposal that could be a great benefit to the military. This rocket has applications well beyond the delivery of warheads. Imagine being able to spy on any region of the Earth. It's beautifully simple. With our R-7 rocket, we could launch a small object into orbit fitted with a camera. Throw anything into the air, it will climb in an arc until its speed can no longer match the force of Earth's gravity and is pulled back down to Earth. Stone or missile, the effect is the same. But with this rocket, we will have the means to throw something much faster and higher. Right out through the Earth's atmosphere. There, it will orbit the Earth 
held in place by the balance of its output speed and the force of Earth's gravity. Now, imagine if we launched our satellite like that. It would circle the planet, photographing everything we would want to see. Even those things the Americans would rather we did not see. They're not sleeping over there, neither are we. This is a military commission. We need to place nuclear warheads on American soil. We don't want spaceships. Von Braun is also on the offensive. In an attempt to outflank his military employers, he persuades Walt Disney Productions to sell his dreams of space direct to the American public. The Earth, more than 1,000 miles below, will appear a gigantic glowing globe, an awe-inspiring sight. North America will look like a great patchwork of green and brown, stretching all the way to the snow-covered Rockies, bordered by the brilliant blue of the seas. On the Earth's night side, the world's cities will appear as twinkling points of light. The Earth itself will be framed by the absolute black of space. The real prize is the conquest of space. And if we don't do it, another nation, possibly a less peace-minded nation, will. With a high-powered telescope, you can see all points on the surface. Cut. Enthralling 40 million viewers on primetime television, Von Braun becomes a household name. And behind the scenes, things begin moving his way. Unlike the Soviets, the Americans secretly plan to develop spy satellites. As cover, they announce a peaceful scientific satellite program. The president today approves plans by this country of going forward for the launching of a small, unmanned, Earth-circling satellite in the region beyond the Earth's atmosphere. The news alarms Koryanov, afraid of losing his chance to be the first in space. Look at what the Americans are up to now. Look. They have Von Braun, so we know they have the technological expertise. For all we know, they could be launching a spy satellite over Moscow within a month. May I suggest to the committee they give me permission to use the new rocket to launch a satellite? You're obliged to and will continue your work as ordered. No one is irreplaceable, comrade. Unknown to Koryanov, Von Braun has to compete for the satellite contract. You understand that this interview will be recorded as a matter of permanent record. He hopes his application to become an American citizen will improve his chances, despite his Nazi background. I only ever met Hitler twice. That is now firmly in my past. The FBI questioned Von Braun's neighbors. It's my opinion that he's an avowed member of the Nazi party. Once a Nazi, always a Nazi, if you ask me. He'd sure be a greater danger to America if he became a national of some other country. I'm a scientist, not a soldier. A rocket is just a vehicle. What it carries is outside my province. To use my knowledge for the benefit of America is my only concern. Subject seems to have little interest in political affairs. He is considered loyal to the United States. Based on this interview, I see no reason to doubt the subject's sincerity in applying for residence. Sign, please. Ten years after he was spirited out of Germany, von Braun hopes he has bought his ticket to space. Congratulations. You are now citizens of the United States of America. God bless you, and God bless America. But his satellite bid faces stiff competition from the U.S. Navy. Well, gentlemen, what do we think? In my mind, Von Braun holds the ace card here. His team certainly the best we've got. He has the greater expertise. So we're agreed then. Von Braun's our man. If I may speak frankly, 
I don't think we should be seen developing a rocket being modified from Nazi vengeance missiles by German engineers. America's first satellite launcher should be exactly that, an American product. Von Braun. Yes, Dr. Von Braun. I have some bad news, I'm afraid. I've been asked to inform you that U.S. Navy have been awarded the satellite contract. We're sorry. Thank you. Von Braun is back to square one, just when his Russian rival is on the verge of his biggest break. Convinced that long-range rockets provide the best means of destroying the United States, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev checks up on Koryanov's progress. Powered by Valentin Glushko's clustered engines, the R-7 will carry the next generation of nuclear warheads. May I introduce the R-7? This is a mock-up of the actual rocket, but completely to scale. A truly impressive machine, Sergei Pavlovich. How much does it weigh? 280 tons at liftoff. Thrust at liftoff will be over 403 tons, more than anything achieved before. What is that in horsepower? That would be approximately 6.4 million, Nikita Sergeyevich. We will run them off the production lines like sausages. <laughs> As you know, Nikita Sergeyevich, we are designing it to carry a five-ton warhead. But that is only one of its applications. There is something else I would love to show you. The R-7 provides us with a chance to make scientific as well as military history. The world's first satellite. The real thing would be seven times the size of this model. What do we have to gain from such a device? It's beautifully simple. It would orbit the Earth at an incredible speed, 18,000 miles an hour, and would be able to spy on any region of the Earth's surface. All we need is the go-ahead to build. It would get in the way of the missile program. Nikita, Nikita Sergeyevich, as we speak, the Americans are spending millions on such a project. Once the R-7 is flying, all we need to do is replace the warhead with the satellite and launch. So, the Americans have uh, shiny new cars, and we have a shiny new satellite. <laughs> But remember, C.K. Pavlich, you better make sure that it works. Khrushchev's blessing, Koryolov wastes no time starting to build his satellite, codenamed Object D. Dozens of different Soviet institutes are involved in the prestigious project. NII-885, radio guidance system. SKB-567, delivered. NII-592, automatic. OKB-10, applied mechanics. NII-4, ballistic and control and measuring devices. As the Cold War arms race intensifies in the mid-50s, both sides test ever more powerful nuclear weapons. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it. First, you duck, and then you cover. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? 
Duck and cover. With the deepening crisis, the American military decide to build medium-range missiles. At last, von Braun is given funds. But to build a larger rocket to carry warheads. The Jupiter C. Although far less powerful than Koryolov's R7, it could launch a small satellite. But von Braun still faces opposition. Then a firing squad of Hungarian soldiers took aim at the red star on the pedestal. Please be informed that on the dates you intend for the test firing, inspectors will arrive and will remain throughout the test period. You know what this is about, don't you? They're checking we don't launch a satellite. They think we might do it accidentally. But we might, mightn't we? Not with Pentagon inspectors around. To prevent von Braun secretly launching a satellite ahead of the US Navy, Pentagon inspectors monitor the maiden flight of the Jupiter Sea. Everything seems fine. Good, let's get on with it. Range, 3,335 miles. Altitude, 682 miles. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes! That gentleman is an altitude record. Feel free to report back to Washington that if they'd allowed us to realize the Jupiter Sea's full potential, they could have made space history today. We could have launched the world's first satellite for America. In the Soviet Union, all Koryolov's hopes of launching a satellite depend on the R-7 rocket and the clustering of its engines. If this first test of the flying cycle works, then your idea of clustering may very well be the way forward. Shut off the fuel lines. What do you think? Fuel line rupture. I have to have equal flow rate to all engines. Takes one valve to fail and you can blow the lot. I warned you clustering was dangerous. Look at it. One test, four engines ruined. I've only got so much manpower, so many parts. So what's your point, Valentin? You want innovation. Well, innovation takes time. Clustering was your choice. I'm not sure we can prove that clustering will ever work. Worse still, work on Koryolov satellite Object D reaches crisis point. It's just too big, by seven centimeters. Unless we remove the Geiger counter system, it just won't fit. Idiots. Idiots. Why don't they take our orders seriously? How the hell are we going to succeed if they don't look at our specifications? They are ignorant lumberjacks. They're not worth the bullets it would take to shoot them. And who's responsible for this? How much extra weight is this introduced? Anyone would think we have a good strain here, not a satellite. We should change it then. Make it lighter and simpler. Let's strip it to the bone, remove the scientific experiments. It will work then.
It has taken just two years to transform Baikonur from a wasteland into the world's first spaceport. Despite the problems, Glushko finally delivers the first engines to the launch site. The engine clusters will provide thrust. Smaller, revolutionary steering engines will set the R7's course. With 32 engines and weighing a massive 280 tons, some believe the R7 will never achieve liftoff. If it does, Sergei Koryalov will get the chance to launch his satellite. The first stepping stone in man's journey to space. The Pentagon continues to reject von Braun's request to launch a satellite, despite the success of his Jupiter C. Special delivery. Direct from outer space. I wrapped this up and placed it inside the nose cone. It survived re-entry and splashed down in the Atlantic. The first rocket made. It's not even singed. So the heat shield works. We have to persuade them. We can launch a satellite. So, why don't we divert some of the component parts from the assembly line? Keep them for later. When the Navy's rocket fails, they'll be thanking us. Von Braun risks court martial by concealing parts of his rocket. Such is his determination to be ready if the US Navy fails. His rival is pushing ahead. All Koryalov has to do now is to test fly his rocket. But first, a long-held Russian tradition to christen the launch. Picking something up here. A lot of it could be a fire. The R7 disintegrates 90 seconds into flight. <sighs> Likely cause. Possibly a fuel leak. An engine problem? There's absolutely no way of knowing that at this stage. There could be any number of contributing factors. Well, let's collect what wreckage we can. We'll soon find out. Comrade Marshal? Perhaps. Sorry. Uh, one failed launch. 32 wrecked engines. If things go on this way, my entire production line will collapse. And my position on this was always clear. It's too ambitious, irresponsibly, wastefully ambitious. I, I can't see it working. The whole thing's being badly mismanaged. If I'd been in charge from the very beginning, I don't think we'd be in this mess now. In June, things get even worse. Mechanical failures prevent takeoff of three more test flights. In July, an R7 clears the launch pad.
But 33 seconds later, an engine cluster detaches too early from the rocket's central core. I'm fine. And what about the rocket? Is that fine? This can't go on. These failures are costly, both in money and time. You had assured me your calculations were correct. There are many innovations, comrade. I have to warn you, comrade. Carry on like this, and I'll shut down your entire test program and have the missile removed and reworked elsewhere. We need the results. Koryolov is given one more test launch. One last chance. But his satellite has gone through a transformation. After abandoning the heavyweight Object D, the team have built a replacement in less than a month. We got the weight down. It's now just over 83 kilograms. Stripped of all complex instrumentation, carrying just a single radio transmitter, it becomes known as the simple Sputnik. Koryolov's career and his dream of conquering space hang on the sixth and final test launch. The R-7 flies over 6,000 kilometers. Further than any rocket ever before, hitting its test target in Siberia, Successful launch. flying far enough to reach America. Now you're gonna have your Sputnik. To prove to the world his Sputnik is in orbit, Koryolov needs it to transmit a signal from space. Combat Corona, it's all right, Pasha Slav. Please continue. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Can I hear it? Of course. It's really very simple. It's just a single beep repeated at regular intervals. engines ignite and the R7 flawlessly clears the pad. Not as a weapon of mass destruction, but as a carrier of one man's lifelong dreams. The rocket's dead on course. We should know in 90 minutes. There's so much left to do, Vasily. I only hope I'm given enough years to make sure they happen.
three minutes past midnight Moscow time, Sputnik 1 becomes the first ever man-made object to orbit Earth. Doctor, they've done it. The Russians. It's just been announced over the radio that the Russians have put a satellite into space. I was in a position a year ago to put a satellite up with my Jupiter C rocket. And I tell you something else, Mr. Secretary. The President is counting on the Navy's rocket. I tell you right now, the Vanguard will never make it. But we can. We can put a satellite up in 60 days. Leave it to me. I'll take it to Washington. Scanning the horizon in Moscow while the world watches the flight of the satellite. They call it Sputnik. Russia hails its own achievement with loud praise. Defense Minister Marshal Zhukov declares Soviet science makes possible newest weapons for its armies, including the intercontinental ballistic missile. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And it, we fear this. It's a devastating blow to American national pride. President Eisenhower is immediately under pressure to close the so-called missile gap. Uh, Mr. President, are you saying you are not concerned about our nation's security? As far as the satellite itself is concerned, it does definitely prove the possession by the Russian scientists of a very powerful thrust in their uh, rocketry. Unknown to the Americans, Korolev is poised to launch a second Sputnik, this time with a passenger. Like. Once sealed inside a makeshift capsule, Laika sits on the pad for two days while the R7 is fueled beneath her. Just four weeks after launching Sputnik, Koryov succeeds in putting the first living creature into space. The Soviet Union has launched a second Earth satellite. Do you admire the Russians for doing it or not? No, definitely not. I said we should have been the first ones to have it if there's such thing. This satellite should be long remembered as a symbol of the torture the animal world must go through. And I don't mean to be facetious at all, but there's a female up there circling Mother Earth. Laika survives just over five hours in orbit before dying of heat exhaustion. What do you think about America not being able to do the same? If I was in military service and fell down on a job like that, I could stand a court-martial. Somebody's fallen down on a job. Ironically, with another Soviet coup, von Braun finds himself blamed for the American failure. <clears throat> Dr. von Braun, what is your current assessment of the Soviets' missile capability? Based on recent events, I would say the Soviets have the capacity to put a hydrogen warhead on Washington today. You're in charge of the Army's missile program. Any responsibility for a missile lag must rest squarely with you. You yourself could have informed the President and Congress that we were not making satisfactory progress under your direction. Dr. Von Braun, perhaps you'd like to explain to this committee what exactly you think you've been doing for the past 10 years. We, from the moment we set foot on U.S. soil, I and my team have been underfunded and underutilized. I have spent years trying to make myself heard. I cannot be held accountable if my employers, which is the U.S. military, fails to take advantage of my abilities. At last, von Braun gets the go-ahead to launch a satellite. But the US Navy is to have first shot. With only weeks to turn it around, von Braun is joined by the scientists William Pickering and James Van Allen, who will design the instruments on board. 
I can't persuade the Pentagon to let us launch our satellite before the Navy, but I want to be ready as soon as they've had their go. The scientific instruments, the radio transmitter, everything must fit inside this space. I'm calling it the Explorer. How quickly can you get this done? In an attempt to restore America's shattered pride, the US Navy rushes its satellite towards launch. The Vanguard rocket has never been tested before, but the world's media are promised that the launch will be the biggest TV spectacle in history. Having risen just three feet from the pad, the only thing to survive the explosion is the satellite. Blown clear, it begins to transmit from the ground nearby. Flopnik, Dodnik, Oopsnik, and my personal favorite, Kaputnik. We've been given a launch, but it's only a three-day window. We have to launch by the end of January. If we miss it, the Navy's second attempt is scheduled for the very next day. This will not happen to us. If successful, von Braun's Explorer will outdo Koryalov's Sputnik by collecting scientific data from space. On the eve of the big day, von Braun is ordered to Washington to deal with the media. But for two days, bad weather prevents the launch. The last day of January, von Braun has until midnight. After that, the US Navy will get a second chance. It's Debus. This is a crazy way to do business, launching rockets by telephone. Kurt, tell me this is good news. We just got word from the weather office. Winds have dropped, and we are ready to go. At last. Good luck, Kurt. I only wish I could be there. Four months after Koryalov launched Sputnik, von Braun's satellite is bound for space. How long can we expect to wait? This is Antigua Island. Four stages fired. Explorer should be on its way. OK, gentlemen. All we can do is wait. It should be over the next tracking station in California in an hour and a half. Until its radio signal reaches the tracking station in California, von Braun will have no confirmation that Explorer is actually in orbit. There is a 90-minute wait. Well, I make that one and a half hours. Where's our signal? California, do you hear her? Nothing. I think we should give it a few minutes leeway. Werner, what happened? Do we have a satellite or don't we? Pickering. We did. Gentlemen, made it to space. Yeah! The reason for the delay is that we made a higher orbit than anyone anticipated. I guess you just made it back into the history books. Well done. Gentlemen, I am proud to announce the successful launch 
of Explorer 1, America's first man-made satellite into Earth's orbit last night. I have long seen my purpose in life as the promotion of space flight. Well, today we have answered the Soviet challenge and in doing so, opened the gates to the heavens. At last, von Braun has a satellite. Are we happy with the dimensions? But still no idea of the identity of the man who has beaten him to it. Apparently, the Americans have even the score. It would appear that we are in a race to space. A race that we, of course, intend to win. <laughs> 